Chapters 11 and 12 of John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11 and still there arose in me no desire for alcohol, no chemical demand. In years and years of heavy drinking, drinking did not beget the desire. Drinking was the way of life I led, the way of the men with whom I lived. While away on my cruises on the bay, I took no drink along. And while out on the bay, the thought of the desirableness of a drink never crossed my mind. It was not until I tied the razzle-dazzle up to the wharf and got ashore in the congregating places of men where drink flowed that the buying of drinks for other men and the accepting of drinks from other men devolved upon me as a social duty and a manhood right. Then, too, there were the times lying at the city wharf or across the estuary on the sand pit when the queen and her sister and her brother Pat and Mrs. Hadley came aboard. It was my boat, I was host, and I could only dispense hospitality in the terms of their understanding of it. So I would rush Spider, or Irish, or Scotty, or whoever was my crew, with the can for beer and the demijohn for red wine. And again, lying at the wharf disposing of my oysters, there were dusky twilights when big policemen and plain clothes men stole on board. And because we lived in the shadow of the police, we opened oysters and fed them to them with squirts of pepper sauce and rushed the growler or got stronger stuff in bottles. Drink as I would, I couldn't come to like John Barleycorn. I valued him extremely well for his associations, but not for the taste of him. All the time I was striving to be a man amongst men, and all the time I nursed secret and shameful desires for candy. But I would have died before I'd let anybody guess it. I used to indulge in lonely debauches, on nights when I knew my crew was going to sleep ashore. I would go up to the free library, exchange my books, buy a quarter's worth of all sorts of candy that chewed and lasted, sneak aboard the razzle-dazzle, lock myself in the cabin, go to bed, and lie there long hours of bliss, reading and chewing candy. And those were the only times I felt that I got my real money's worth. Dollars and dollars across the bar couldn't buy the satisfaction that 25 cents did in a candy store. As my drinking grew heavier, I began to note more and more that it was in the drinking bouts the purple passages occurred. Drunks were always memorable. At such times things happened. Men like Joe Goose dated existence from drunk to drunk. The longshoremen all looked forward to their Saturday night drunk. We, of the oyster boats, waited until we had disposed of our cargoes before we got really started, though a scattering of drinks and a meeting of a chance friend sometimes precipitated an accidental drunk. In ways, the accidental drunks were the best. 
Stranger and more exciting things happened at such times, as, for instance, the Sunday when Nelson and French Frank and Captain Spink stole the stolen salmon boat from Whiskey Bob and Nicky the Greek. Changes had taken place in the personnel of the oyster boats. Nelson had got into a fight with Bill Kelly on the Annie and was carrying a bullet hole through his left hand. Also, having quarreled with Clam and broken partnership, Nelson had sailed the reindeer, his arm in a sling, with a crew of two deep-water sailors, and he had sailed so madly as to frighten them ashore. Such was the tale of his recklessness they spread that no one on the waterfront would go out with Nelson. So the reindeer, crewless, lay across the estuary at the sand spit. Beside her lay the razzle-dazzle, with a burned mainsail and Scotty and me on board. Whiskey Bob had fallen out with French Frank and gone on a raid upriver with Nicky the Greek. The result of this raid was a brand new Columbia River salmon boat, stolen from an Italian fisherman. We oyster pirates were all visited by the searching Italian, and we were convinced from what we knew of their movements that Whiskey Bob and Nicky the Greek were the guilty parties. But where was the salmon boat? Hundreds of Greek and Italian fishermen upriver and down the bay had searched every slough and tool patch for it. When the owner despairingly offered a reward of $50, our interest increased and the mystery deepened. One Sunday morning, old Captain Spink paid me a visit. The conversation was confidential. He had just been fishing in his skiff at the old Alameda ferry slip. As the tide went down, he had noticed a rope tied to a pile underwater and leading downward. In vain, he had tried to heave up what was fast on the other end. Farther along to another pile was a similar rope leading downward and unheavable. Without doubt, it was the missing salmon boat. If we restored it to its rightful owner, there was fifty dollars in it for us. But I had queer ethical notions about honor amongst thieves and declined to have anything to do with the affair. But French Frank had quarreled with Whiskey Bob, and Nelson was also an enemy. Poor Whiskey Bob! Without viciousness, good-natured, generous, born weak, raised poorly, with an irresistible chemical demand for alcohol, still prosecuting his vocation of bay pirate, his body was picked up, not long afterward, beside a dock where it had sunk full of gunshot wounds. Within an hour after I had rejected Captain Spink's proposal, I saw him sail down the estuary on board the reindeer with Nelson. Also, French Frank went by on his schooner. It was not long ere they sailed back up the estuary, curiously side by side. As they headed in for the sand spit, the submerged salmon boat could be seen, gunnels awash, and held up from sinking by ropes fast to the schooner and the sloop. The tide was half out, and they sailed squarely in on the sand, grounding in a row with the salmon boat in the middle. Immediately Hans, one of French Frank's sailors, was into a skiff and pulling rapidly for the north slope. 
the big demijohn in the stern sheets told his errand they couldn't wait a moment to celebrate the fifty dollars they had so easily earned it is the way of the devotees of john barleycorn when good fortune comes they drink when they have no fortune they drink to the hope of good fortune if fortune be ill they drink to forget it if they meet a friend they drink if they quarrel with a friend and lose him they drink if their love-making be crowned with success they are so happy they needs must drink if they be jilted they drink for the contrary reason and if they haven't anything to do at all why they take a drink secure in the knowledge that when they have taken a sufficient number of drinks the maggots will start crawling in their brains and they will have their hands full with things to do when they are sober they want to drink and when they have drunk they want to drink more of course as fellow comrades scotty and i were called in for the drinking we helped to make a hole in that fifty dollars not yet received the afternoon from just an ordinary common summer sunday afternoon became a generous purple afternoon we all talked and sang and ranted and bragged and ever french frank and nelson sent more drinks around we lay in full sight of the oakland waterfront and the noise of our revels attracted friends skiff after skiff crossed the estuary and hauled up on the sand spit while Hans work was cut out for him ever to row back and forth for more supplies of booze then whiskey Bob and Nicky the Greek arrived sober indignant outraged in that their fellow pirates had raised their plant French Frank aided by John Barleycorn orated hypocritically about virtue and honesty and despite his fifty years got whiskey bob out on the sand and proceeded to lick him when nicky the greek jumped in with a short-handed shovel to whiskey bob's assistant short work was made of him by hans and of course when the bleeding remnants of bob and nicky were sent packing in their skiff the event must needs be celebrated in further carousal by this time our visitors being numerous we were a large crowd compounded of many nationalities and diverse temperaments all aroused by john barleycorn all restraints cast off old quarrels revived ancient hates flared up fight was in the air and whenever a longshoreman remembered something against a scow schooner sailor or vice versa or an oyster pirate remembered or was remembered a fist shot out and another fight was on and every fight was made up in more rounds of drinks wherein the combatants aided and abetted by the rest of us embraced each other and pledged undying friendship and of all times soup kennedy selected this time to come and retrieve an old shirt of his left aboard the reindeer from the trip he sailed with clam he had espoused clam's side of the quarrel with nelson also he had been drinking in the st louis house so that it was John Barleycorn who led him to the sand pit in quest of his old shirt. Few words started the fray. 
He locked with Nelson in the cockpit of the ring deer, and in the mix-up barely escaped being brained by an iron bar wielded by irate French Frank. Irate because a two-handed man had attacked a one-handed man. If the reindeer still floats, the dent of the iron bar remains in the hardwood rail of her cockpit. But Nelson pulled his bandaged hand, bullet perforated, out of its sling, and held by us, wept and roared his berserker belief that he could lick Soup Kennedy one-handed. And we let them loose on the sand. Once, when it looked as if Nelson were getting the worst of it, French Frank and John Barleycorn sprang unfairly into the fight. Scotty protested and reached for French Frank, who whirled upon him and fell on top of him in a pummeling clinch after a sprawl of twenty feet across the sand. In the course of separating these two, half a dozen fights started amongst the rest of us. These fights were finished one way or the other, or we separated them with drinks, while all the time Nelson and Soup Kennedy fought on. Occasionally we returned to them and gave advice, such as, when they lay exhausted in the sand, unable to strike a blow, throw sand in his eyes. And they threw sand in each other's eyes, recuperated, and fought on to successive exhaustions. And now, of all this that is squalid and ridiculous and bestial, try to think what it meant to me. A youth not yet sixteen, burning with the spirit of adventure, fancy filled with tales of buccaneers and sea rovers, sacks of cities and conflicts of armed men, and imagination maddened by the stuff I had drunk. It was life raw and naked, wild and free, the only life of that sort which my birth in time and space permitted me to attain. And more than that, it carried a promise. It was the beginning. From the sand spit, the way led out through the golden gate to the vastness of adventure of all the world, where battles would be fought, not for old shirts and over-stolen salmon boats, but for high purposes and romantic ends. And because I told Scotty what I thought of his letting an old man like French Frank get away with him, we too brawled and added to the festivity of the sandpit. And Scotty threw up his job as crew, and departed in the night with a pair of blankets belonging to me. During the night, while the other oyster pirates lay stupefied in their bunks, the schooner and the reindeer floated on the high water and swung about to their anchors. The salmon boat, still filled with rocks and water, rested on the bottom. In the morning, early, I heard wild cries from the reindeer, and tumbled out in the chill gray to see a spectacle that made the waterfront laugh for days. The beautiful salmon boat lay on the hard sand, squashed flat as a pancake, while on it were perched French Frank schooner and the reindeer. Unfortunately, two of the reindeer's planks had been crushed in by the stout oak stem of the salmon boat. The rising tide had flowed through the hole and just awakened Nelson by getting into his bunk with him. I lent a hand and 
and we pumped the reindeer out and repaired the damage. Then Nelson cooked breakfast, and while we ate, we considered the situation. He was broke. So was I. The fifty dollars reward would never be paid for that pitiful mess of splinters on the sand beneath us. He had a wounded hand and no crew. I had a burned mainsail and no crew. What do you say, you and me? Nelson queried. I'll go you, was my answer. And thus I became partners with young Scratch Nelson the wildest, maddest of them all. We borrowed the money for an outfit of grub from Johnny Heinhold, filled our water barrels, and sailed away that day for the oyster beds. End of chapter, chapter 12 Nor have I ever regretted those months of mad devilry I put in with Nelson. He could sail, even if he did frighten every man that sailed with him. To steer to miss destruction by an inch or an instant was his joy. To do what everybody else did not dare attempt to do was his pride. Never to reef down was his mania. And in all the time I spent with him, blow high or low, the reindeer was never reefed, nor was she ever dry. We strained her open and sailed her open and sailed her open continually. And we abandoned the Oakland waterfront and went wider afield for our adventures. And all this glorious passage in my life was made possible for me by John Barleycorn. And this is my complaint against John Barleycorn. Here I was, thirsting for the wild life of adventure, and the only way for me to win to it was through John Barleycorn's meditation. It was the way of the men who lived the life. Did I wish to live the life, I must live it the way they did. It was by virtue of drinking that I gained that partnership and comradeship with Nelson. Had I drunk only the beer he paid for, or had I declined to drink at all, I should never have been selected by him as a partner. He wanted a partner who would meet with him on the social side, as well as the work side of life. I abandoned myself to the life and developed the misconception that the secret of John Barleycorn lay in going on mad drunks, rising through the successive stages that only an iron constitution could endure to final stupefaction and swinish unconsciousness. I do not like the taste, so I drank for the sole purpose of getting drunk, of getting hopelessly, helplessly drunk. And I, who had saved and scraped, traded like a Shylock and made junkmen weep, I, who had stood aghast when French Frank, at a single stroke, spent eighty cents for whiskey for eight men, I turned myself loose with a more lavish disregard for money than any of them. I remember going ashore one night with Nelson. In my pocket were one hundred and eighty dollars. It was my intention first to buy some clothes, after that some drinks. I needed the clothes. All I possessed were on me, and they were as follows a pair of sea boots that providentially leaked the water out as fast as it ran in, a pair of fifty-cent overalls, a forty-cent cotton shirt, and a sou'wester. I had no hat, so I had to wear the sou'wester, 
and it will be noted that I have listed neither underclothes nor socks. I didn't own any. To reach the stores where clothes could be bought, we had to pass a dozen saloons. So I bought me the drinks first. I never got to the clothing stores. In the morning, broke, poisoned but contented, I came back on board and we set sail. I possessed only the clothes I had gone ashore in, and not a cent remained of the one hundred and eighty dollars. It might well be deemed impossible by those who have never tried it, that in twelve hours a lad can spend all of one hundred and eighty dollars for drinks. I know otherwise. And I had no regrets. I was proud. I had shown them I could spend with the rest of them. Amongst strong men I had proved myself strong. I had clinched again, as I had often clinched, my right to the title of prince. Also, my attitude may be considered, in part, as a reaction from my childhood's meagerness and my childhood's excessive toil. Possibly my inchoate thought was, better to remain amongst booze-fighters, a prince, than to toil twelve hours a day at a machine for ten cents an hour. There are no purple passages in machine toil. But if the spending of one hundred and eighty dollars in twelve hours isn't a purple passage, then I'd like to know what is. Oh, I skip much of the details of my trafficking with John Barleycorn during this period, and shall only mention events that will throw light on John Barleycorn's ways. There were three things that enabled me to pursue this heavy drinking. First, a magnificent constitution far better than the average. Second, the healthy open-air life on the water. And third, the fact that I drank irregularly. While out on the water, we never carried any drink along. The world was opening up to me. Already I knew several hundred miles of the waterways of it, and of the towns and cities and fishing hamlets on the shores. Came the whisper to range farther. I had not found it yet. There was more behind. But even this much of the world was too wide for Nelson. He wearied for his beloved Oakland waterfront, and when he elected to return to it, we separated in all friendliness. I now made the old town of Benicia on the Carquinez Straits my headquarters. In a cluster of fishermen's arks, moored in the tools on the waterfront, dwelt a congenial crowd of drinkers and vagabonds, and I joined them. I had longer spells ashore between fooling with salmon fishing and making raids up and down bay and rivers as a deputy fish patrolman, and I drank more and learned more about drinking. I held my own with anyone, drink for drink, and often drank more than my share to show the strength of my manhood. When, on a morning, my unconscious carcass was disentangled from the nets on the drying frames, whither I had stupidly, blindly crawled the night before, and when the waterfront talked it over with many a giggle and laugh and another drink, I was proud indeed. It was an exploit. And when I never drew a sober breath on one stretch for three solid weeks, I was certain I had reached the top. Surely in that direction one could go no farther. It was time for me to move on, for always 
drunk or sober, at the back of my consciousness, something whispered that this carousing and bay adventuring was not all of life. This whisper was my good fortune. I happened to be so made that I could hear it calling, always calling, out and away over the world. It was not canniness on my part, it was curiosity, desire to know, an unrest and a seeking for things wonderful that I seemed somehow to have glimpsed or guessed. What was this life for, I demanded, if this were all? No, there was something more, away and beyond. And in relation to my much later development as a drinker, this whisper, this promise of the things at the back of life, must be noted, for it was destined to play a dire part in my more recent wrestlings with John Barleycorn. But what gave immediacy to my decision to move on was a trick John Barleycorn played me, a monstrous, incredible trick that showed abysses of intoxication hitherto undreamed. At one o'clock in the morning, after a prodigious drunk, I was tottering aboard a sloop at the end of the wharf, intending to go to sleep. The tide sweep through Carquinez Straits as in a mill race, and the full ebb was on when I stumbled overboard. There was nobody on the wharf, nobody on the sloop. I was borne away by the current. I was not startled. I thought the misadventure delightful. I was a good swimmer, and in my inflamed condition the contact of the water with my skin soothed me like cool linen. And then John Barleycorn played me his maniacal trick. Some maundering fancy of going out with the tide suddenly obsessed me. I had never been morbid. Thoughts of suicide had never entered my head. And now that they entered, I thought it fine, a splendid culminating, a perfect rounding off of my short but exciting career. I who had never known girl's love, nor woman's love, nor the love of children, who had never played in the wide joy fields of art, nor climbed the star-cool heights of philosophy, nor seen with my eyes more than a pinpoint surface of the gorgeous world, I decided that this was all that I had seen all, lived all, been all, that was worth while, and that now was the time to cease. This was the trick of John Barleycorn, laying me by the heels of my imagination, and in a drug dream, dragging me to death. Oh, he was convincing. I had really experienced all of life, and it didn't amount to much. The swinish drunkenness in which I had lived for months, this was accompanied by the sense of degradation and the old feeling of conviction of sin, was the last and the best, and I could see for myself what it was worth. There were all the broken-down old bums and loafers I had bought drinks for. That was what remained of life. Did I want to become like them? A thousand times no. And I wept tears of sweet sadness over my glorious youth going out with the tide. 
And who has not seen the weeping drunk, the melancholic drunk? They are to be found in all the bar rooms. If they can find no other listener telling their sorrows to the barkeeper who is paid to listen. The water was delicious. It was a man's way to die. John Barleycorn changed the tune he played in my drink-maddened brain. Away with tears and regret. It was a hero's death, and by the hero's own hand and will. So I struck up my death chant, and was singing it lustily, when the gurgle and splash of the current riffles in my ears reminded me of my more immediate situation. Below the town of Benicia, where the Solano Wharf projects, the straits widen out into what bayfarers call the Bight of Turner's Shipyard. I was in the shore tide that swept under the Solano Wharf and up into the Bight. I knew of old the power of the suck which developed when the tide swung around the end of Dead Man's Island and drove straight for the wharf. I didn't want to go through those piles. It wouldn't be nice, and I might lose an hour in the bite on my way out with the tide. I undressed in the water and struck out with a strong, single overhand stroke, crossing the current at right angles. Nor did I cease until, by the wharf lights, I knew I was safe to sweep by the end. Then I turned over and rested. The stroke had been a telling one, and I was a little time in recovering my breath. I was elated, for I had succeeded in avoiding the suck. I started to raise my death chant again, a purely extemporized farrago of a drug-crazed youth. Don't sing yet, whispered John Barleycorn. The Solano runs all night. There are railroad men on the wharf. They will hear you and come out in a boat and rescue you, and you don't want to be rescued. I certainly didn't. What? Be robbed of my hero's death? Never. And I lay on my back in the starlight, watching the familiar wharf lights go by, red and green and white, and bidding sad sentimental farewell to them, each and all. When I was well clear in mid-channel, I sang again. Sometimes I swam a few strokes, but in the main I contented myself with floating and dreaming long drunken dreams. Before daylight, the chill of the water and the passage of the hours had sobered me sufficiently to make me wonder what portion of the straits I was in and also to wonder if the turn of the tide wouldn't catch me and take me back ere I had drifted out into San Pablo Bay. Next, I discovered that I was very weary and very cold, and quite sober, and that I didn't in the least want to be drowned. I could make out the Selby smelter on the Contra Costa shore and the Mare Island lighthouse. I started to swim for the Solano shore, but was too weak and chilled, and made so little headway, and at the cost of such painful effort, that I gave it up and consented myself with floating, now and then giving a stroke to keep my balance in the tide rips which were increasing the commotion on the surface of the water. And new fear. I was sober now, and I didn't want to die. I discovered scores of reasons for living. 
and the more reasons I discovered, the more liable it seemed that I was going to drown anyway. Daylight, after I had been four hours in the water, found me in a parlous condition in the tide rips off Mare Island, where the swift ebbs from Vallejo Straits and Carquinas Straits were fighting with each other and where, at that particular moment, they were fighting the flood tide setting up against them from San Pablo Bay. A stiff breeze had sprung up, and the crisp little waves were persistently lapping into my mouth, and I was beginning to swallow salt water. With my swimmer's knowledge, I knew the end was near. And then the boat came a Greek fisherman running in for Vallejo. And again I had been saved from John Barleycorn by my constitution and physical vigor. And in passing, let me note that this maniacal trick John Barleycorn played me is nothing uncommon. An absolute statistic of the percentage of suicides due to John Barleycorn would be appalling. In my case, healthy, normal, young, full of the joy of life, the suggestion to kill myself was unusual, but it must be taken into account that it came on the heels of a long carouse when my nerves and brain were fearfully poisoned, and that the dramatic, romantic side of my imagination, drink-maddened to lunacy, was delighted with the suggestion. And yet the older, more morbid drinkers, more jaded with life and more disillusioned, who kill themselves, do so usually after a long debauch, when their nerves and brains are thoroughly poison-soaked. End of chapter 12